All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and those that are in the uh, special waiting room with us. Uh, I'm going to let Bob do a little quick introduction, and then we will uh, we'll kick things off. Cool. Uh, Bob Coppage, CEO Grand Pooba of uh, Simplex IT, located in over in Stowe, Ohio. Awesome. And uh, I'm Mike DePalm. I'm the Senior Channel Development Manager for Datto. So we are a uh, backup disaster recovery company out in Norwalk, Connecticut, right outside of New York City. So uh, typically I go around, I do a lot of these presentations live, but obviously I've been grounded for the last seven months. So spending a lot of time on, on Zoom and go to webinar and all the rest. So before we get started, I kind of want to set the stage. I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a history nerd. I read a lot of history books and uh, you know, watch documentaries and things like that. So I always think about things in context of where we are. So if you look at the, the course of human history, there's always been these eras that have really defined, you know, a, a specific age in, in, in human history, whether it's the Stone Age or the Bronze Age or the Renaissance. And with all of these, you know, there were, there were technological advancements that really propelled the human race. Now, the problem is those same technological advancements were being exploited by the bad actors in every one of these phases. And now, you know, you, you go out a thousand years from now and you look back at the time we're in right now, clearly we're in the information age, the digital, digital data revolution age. And I think everybody can kind of agree on that. And, and to be honest, thank goodness we are, right? I mean, where would we be over the last chaotic six, seven months if we didn't have access uh, to all this, these remote communication capabilities and all the rest? But the problem is, obviously, uh, just like every other stage that we looked at, you know, there's bad actors exploiting those same technologies. And so it's always this race back and forth to see, you know, who wins. And unfortunately, a lot of times the, the, the bad guys recruit a lot of the smartest people. Um, so it's an ongoing battle. And when you look at really what happened, and this really goes for any sort of disaster, whether it's hurricane season down south or wherever it might be, there, there are certain phases that every company goes through. And specifically, when we look at what happened uh with COVID-19, I mean, first and foremost, phase one, crisis emerged. It came on us pretty quick. I, I was actually down in, in Mexico with Datto. Uh, I left on March 10th. At the time, there was a, there was a couple cases. Um, two days later, that NBA player got it, and then they shut down the NBA, and everybody kind of raised their eyes. And by the time I came back on the 15th, we were probably on one of the last flights back from Mexico. I mean, the world had changed. I, I still haven't been into my office anything like that. So it happened really fast. And so phase two was, all right, let's just make sure everybody's safe, right? And then when we got to phase three, this is really where IT came in and it was, okay, we're, we're all working from wherever we're working from. Uh, what do we do now? How, how do we operate? How do we stay protected? How do I get devices in people's hands? Um, and this is really, and we're going to, we're going to talk about co-managed IT and the things that, that Bob does, but, um, you know, this is really where the preparation and the tools and to enable you to work remote and install that business software and get all the security measures in place really came about. And then right now we're probably sitting, depending on where you are and what industry you're in, somewhere between phase four and phase five. Uh, eventually we'll get to the most cliche term in the industry, the new normal, uh, which is whatever that'll be. But I really think the, the, the focus here on phase four, five and six is agility because nobody knows where we'll be. And the ability to just be able to work wherever you're physically sitting is really going to be the new norm, in my opinion. Now, Bob, how, what do you think about these, these phases? And talk a little bit about you know, where, where you were able to step in and some of the experiences you had. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, I mean, I hate to say that about that because it sounds like this external, I'm, I'm really watching it, really enjoying it or whatever, which obviously isn't the case. But it is so different depending upon what kind of vertical industry organizations are, uh, as well as what's whereabouts uh, from a geographical standpoint, as well as what was the original health of the organizations. And not only that, it also flows uphill and upstream and downstream, meaning that if your clients are affected by it, even if you're not, it, you, you run into that situation, uh, you know, when someone else sneezes, you catch a cold. So there was a lot of flexibility that we ran into and, and where we truly had to implement work from home strategies uh, immediately within a few weeks. Being in Ohio, we, we uh, were aggressive in terms of some of the shutdown stuff that was done, um, but then had to play catch up to make sure it was done properly. And uh, again, it, it kind of like what you, you were alluding to, this work from home mantra became work from anywhere and agile became the, the, the word of the day. Yeah, you know, when I when I came out of the construction industry actually before I came over to Datto, and we did large, you know, schools, hospitals, and we always did a lessons learned afterwards. 
And, you know, a project could have gone as smooth as can be, but there's always lessons to be learned. And I'm, I'm hoping that the business community is doing the same thing as we kind of toggle back and forth between phase four and phase five and, you know, look at some of those pain points that everybody experienced to some extent and not, you know, repeat those. Is that something you're going through now, Bob? Looking back yeah, and saying for, for the next time this, this happens or we're ready? It's actually, it's a combination of those things. One is you want to make sure that you're ready, but you also want to make sure you're also flexibility and you're flexible in terms of what responses are because the next pandemic may not be the same kind or the next disaster may not be a pandemic. It may be another hurricane. It may be a disruption in communication or something along those lines, which is where that word agility really comes into play because you're, I'd hate to say you're ready for anything, but you're much more flexible in terms of your responses. Yeah, I think that is the key. I mean, I think it's a living, breathing document as you look at what's going to happen here. Um, so, you know, we look at those cyber criminals, um, you know, they're, they're, it is really shifted from the guy in his basement to organized, corporate, structured criminal enterprises. It's pretty amazing. I mean, there are, there are places in the world where people go to the office, they punch a time card, they sit at their desk and do you know, cyber attacks all day long and they, they punch out and they go home and they have dinner with their families and, you know, it truly is this corporate structure. So when we look at what these guys are doing and we see, you know, the increase and we've seen increase in ransomware, the R study showed that the increase in ransomware since Q2 was 124%. I was on a webinar last week where a gentleman from one of the, uh, the cloud security companies said it was 500%. I, so it, it's still an increase either way. And it's because these guys are so opportunistic, right? They, they, they'll they send, instead of sending the email out from your long lost uncle, going to make a, you know, a millionaire in his will, this really is, hey, this is from the CDC. Click here to see what kind of infections are in your area or what kind of precautions you need to take. And it, it took them just days to do that. I mean, that Johns Hopkins website that everybody checked out, especially early on, what states were getting infected and all the rest. There was a mirrored website that was being shared on social media that was malicious. It looked just like anything else. So, they, you know, they're, they're extremely opportunistic on that side. And that's why we really have to be you know, really vigilant to see what we're doing. And to your point earlier about different industries, we do an internal ransomware study where we interview the managed services community, right? So folks like Bob, as well as the small business community. And we found every single vertical is susceptible to these attacks. And there's this false sense of security of, hey, I'm a, I'm a small business. What criminal is going to spend any time attacking me? Well, with ransomware, they don't even care what your data is or whether it's valuable on the dark web. They just know that you can't operate without it. So they're able to cast this gigantic net and really impact every single industry out there. And, you know, the, the, the government put out a statement on Monday talking about the threats of ransomware and how there's been a spike uh, during the last six months. And the problem is when we look at the small and mid-sized business community, less than a quarter of these attacks are being reported. And for one, the FBI is not going to look into anything. They won't say it publicly, but probably $100,000 or less, maybe even more. They don't have the bandwidth to do that. They want you to report it so they can get some stats and maybe find some, some general vulnerabilities that are being exploited, but they're not putting a ton of resources into a $10,000 ransomware ask. But I think the bigger reason why people aren't reporting it is because they don't want that hit to their reputation. They don't want to be known as the company in their region and in their industry that's been attacked because it's going to, even though the data might not have been stolen, it's still a blemish on your company. And so folks want to handle it real quick in house, or that's the reason why people pay. They just want to get over it. They just want to be done with it. And so, you know, that's one of the things we're running into. And, and I mean, when we look at these stats, Bob, I mean, do they kind of jive with what you're seeing actually out, you know, in the workforce? Well, absolutely. And it gets back to the, to the point that you were making earlier. The term I love to use is entrepreneurs. The bad guys are entrepreneurs in the in the classic sense. They look for opportunities and they will create their uh, response or their marketing, their products for those opportunities. So anything that happens that generates a whole lot of buzz, a whole lot of interest, a whole lot of, of pardon my French, knee-jerk reactions to people will click on stuff, they will turn that into, whether it be mirrored websites like you're talking about or, or uh, phishing or spear phishing attacks or whatever, they are engaged to the point where they're actually, they will hold your reputation ransom mm -hmm. by offering to say, basically, if you don't pay this ransom, we will let the social media world know that you were compromised. So they're holding that at, at bay as well. Yeah, I mean, even if you look, um, and sometimes you're exactly. It's sometimes it's not even about money per se, as it is, you know, in like ripple effects and all that, scaring folks. 
Um, you might have seen the story. There was a, a school district out in Nevada that they got they, they actually were breached and the student records were being held for ransom and the, the district didn't pay for it. And they re, they sent out all of the student records and, and private information. That's a direct FERPA violation right there. And, uh, you know, they, the, the district kind of, you know, called their bluff and they, they went for it. And so, yeah, I mean, these are these are these are the bad guys, you know, I mean, they, they, they will try to exploit it. We saw it. I mean, even disgustingly, we saw it during like the, the school sh the school shooting spree where they were exploiting that. And the emails were going out to CEO saying, hey, there's an active shooter at your kid's elementary school. I mean, that's how disgusting these people are. And, uh, you know, like you said, they, they're in there to make money and they do it in bad ways. But this is, you know, this is what organized crime has shifted to, unfortunately. So, you know, what, the way that businesses really around the world, but especially like North America is kind of at the forefront of this, have been managing their IT has shifted pretty dramatically. And one of the ways that that's happened has been this co-managed IT model where there is an in-house team uh, working in conjunction with a managed service provider in a true partnership, not replacing somebody, but really working in a true uh, relationship like that. And, and we've seen that grow exponentially over the last year or so, but also over the last six or seven months. And we did a survey, we talked to 1,100 SMBs around North America. So we got a huge sample size here. And we started off with kind of a, a basic broad question. Have you lost business or revenue due to IT? And you see it across the board, you know, about a third of these companies have, which is a pretty staggering number. But you know, when you look at what that actually means, it could mean various things. Did you lose clients? Um, did you lose money because your, your staff was shut down and then they had to play catch up and, and those type of things? So what would you say, Bob, when you look at this broad question, I mean, what do you judge losing business or revenue due to IT to mean? One of the things whenever we talk to uh, small, medium business management is we try to get a feel for, for their interpretation of their own IT. Is, is IT an expense or is it a value? And almost always the healthier companies are going to say this is value. This brings our ability to deal with our client needs in a more effective and efficient manner, brings value to our offering that we're giving. And so when that doesn't work, the company suffers in terms of value and, and, and they know that. And so to me, that's the issue. And especially when you look at uh, things like what, what happened this year as far as COVID and all of that kind of fun silliness, um, the flow of information, the flow of processing was significantly disrupted because the workforce was significantly disrupted. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we talked about anybody that was in early, you heard me talking about the, the digital transformation uh, topic. Um, and it's really kind of replacing some of the basic manual things that a business does with, with technology. And again, that goes back to that first chart. And this is great. This is the world we live in. It's accelerating. It's not just about a necessity, like, like you said, a cost center, like, hey, I have to pay for IT. It's actually driving revenue and it's actually, you know, driving margin and all the rest. And so, you know, there's a huge opportunity for that. And when we looked at that survey, 71% um, of that, that sample size still handled everything in-house. The traditional, I have an in-house IT person who handles it. When you look at the 29%, the folks that were working with a managed service provider in some capacity, 61% were already in this co-managed model, which is it's pretty new. I mean, I know, Bob, you've been doing it for a long time, but it's, it's kind of a new concept. It was mostly either handling in-house or outsource. Now that that collaboration has been really critical and it's been awesome. And when we looked at those folks, those, those people within that 29 percent as to why they did that and what their challenges were. I mean, security is top of mind for everybody. Um, just the typical, you know, technical technical support. But the increasing cost of IT and compliance issues is key. I do a lot of presentations. I'm not a compliance expert by any means, but. At the end of the day, what these compliance issues are trying to do is kind of shift that burden over to the business ultimately and say, you better hope you're protected because if not, we're going to come knocking on your door and make sure you have to open up your plan. And then the complexity of things, you know, the, the complexity of I know I need a new antivirus, but is it is it just, hey, I went with the, the cheapest one or the guy with the best sales rep or marketing or, or is it truly the best for my business? And so these are the reasons why we see people saying, hey, there, you know, I, I do have a great in-house IT team, but there's ways that, you know, working with a managed service provider makes a lot of sense. And, you know, when we looked at the, the folks that were outsourcing, where did they kind of stand? Um, not overly surprising. A lot of the folks, 100 season below, 
tended to be in that outsourced IT only. As you know, you move up market into some of the larger seed counts, you see more of a co-managed IT. But that being said, you see a lot of folks, 100 seats and below, working in a co-managed IT model. And I think the important thing when I you know, first started out and talked about the shift and the mindset shift here, when we looked at how long these folks have been outsourcing their IT, that co-managed group, 29% of that big piece of the pie, were not working in a co-managed model at all 12 months ago. So this is a newer concept that's really, you know, catching fire throughout the business community because they're seeing the true value in it. And ultimately, the thing that makes the most sense is, look, how satisfied were, were they with, with how they were managing their IT? Uh, the internal only were the least satisfied. That big 71% chop of the pot there. Uh, outsourced IT comes in second and then co-managed IT tended to be the most satisfied with how they manage their IT. And so before we get into some of the tips and tricks, I mean, talk a little bit about what that relationship actually looks like on the ground. How does that relationship that you have with existing IT company, you know, IT staffs work? Yeah. And, and again, I've, I've written the only two books that are written on this topic uh, currently out there on co-managed co IT services. It is a relationship. There are certain things that internal IT, like you were talking about, Internal IT does not have the time to review all possible tools and products and services and all that. A managed service provider, that's what we do. We do have the time for that. But similarly, internal IT knows the organization better than an MSP will. So they know what the particular value drivers are. They know the particular things that really matter most uh, better than an MSP will. That's not to say we don't care or we don't know, but we're just not as good at it because we're not there every day for eight hours a day. So it, it's when it's done right, when it is a true partnership between the internal IT folks and the managed service provider, commits, it, it's additive. It's not a zero sum game. The sum of the parts is actually greater than the individual parts. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to your point, I mean, you literally wrote the book on this. So, you know, when when we decided to go forward, I had a lot of pressure on me, Bob. I mean, you wrote the book on this. I'm hoping all my stats and stories add up here. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, so far, so good. I so know. far, so good. It's a B. It's a minus. <laughs> um, so, so we want to talk a little bit about working together and what that looks like. And like you said, I mean, there's 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 definitely roles in, in all of that. And, and one of the things I think is important, and we've emphasized it here, is just the idea that you are a target online. You have to create this, this culture of security because, you know, I went back when I was out on the road all the time, I'd get the question all the time. Well, can you just tell me how, what are the chances I can get attacked? It's, it's a hundred percent. Everybody listening right. is getting attacked right now. It's a matter of whether you're stopping from it from getting in. Hopefully it starts really with your people. They're not clicking on what they're not supposed to. If they do, you're not letting in. And it's this multi-layered approach but it really is that mindset of, yes, you are a target. And that then leads to policies and procedures. This is something that is often overlooked, even with some of the larger companies, not having this written down that can be reviewed, can be updated. I know that's a big thing of what you do, Bob. And I think, again, it's a great to have a second set of eyes. So, so talk a little bit about what that process looks like as you're starting to, to put together some policies and procedures with a, a company. Yeah, there's, there's two ways to think about this. Number one, is is the training like you're saying is are we training our employees to do what they're supposed to do but also is are we instructing them are we guiding them so that they know what the expectation is we know whether or not someone's supposed to handle a piece of machinery out on the shop floor safely because that's in doc that's well documented we know how they're supposed to report time off we know all those things because we're used to identifying those in policies and procedures. But if we don't tell them, are they allowed to use their computers at work for home uh, for, for personal use or vice versa? What are they allowed to do, supposed to do, and what are the repercussions if they muck up? Yeah, if a lot we of don't time. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, if we don't tell them ahead of time, how as employers can we reasonably, reasonably expect them to behave appropriately? Yeah, it's exactly right. You might think it's common sense, but if it's not written down, you know, everybody's got different interpretations of what they're supposed to be doing and what they're not supposed to be doing and, you know, and all the rest. And that leads right into that ongoing training. Um, you know, a lot of companies I talk to, they say, yeah, when we onboard somebody new, we go, they go through training. And like anything else, the folks that are listening to this webinar, for the next two weeks, you will be 
you know, all about security and you, okay, these are the threats and it's human nature. If it's not ongoing, it, it's out of sight, out of mind. And I, I, so, you know, talk a little bit about that, Bob, when you talk about ongoing training, I mean, 91% of the data loss and downtime becomes because of user error, not necessarily because of a malicious act, but because people didn't know what they were not supposed to click on. So think about think about this as an ongoing ongoing issue. It's it's what I call an infinite game. It never ends. So we've been talking about how many new ways the bad guys have come up uh, with in order to get through your employees. So if they're coming up with new things all the time, the training needs to keep up with that. Or else, you know, two year ago training, we might as well tell them how to change the shoe on a horse. <laughs> No, that's, that, that's exactly right. And it goes to the entire IT plan. Um, you know, so another simple thing. I mean, these aren't things that you're, you're making a ton of, you know, uh, you know, expense on, you know, like password management. I'd go do panels five years ago and the number one password, password one, two, three, four, and everybody would laugh, but it's true. And then, you know, now, okay, I'm going to put an exclamation point in. These criminals never figure that out. I mean, there's software where they're running that will crack that in milliseconds. And so there's the password management side of things and, and really, you know, uh, training on that and also some tools there, but also simple things like multi-factor authentication. I mean, every day I log in, I got a, I get a, a push to my cell phone and then a facial recognition, and then I could add, you know, log in. And I honestly don't know, eventually it'll happen. The government should make this mandatory for businesses. I mean, it, it goes so, such a long way. I mean, Bob, when you go walk in the door of a, a new client or a prospect, I mean, how often do you see password management being a glaring issue? Oh, absolutely. It, it's frequent. And and it's one of those where, and again, this is especially where the commits, uh, the co-managed world comes from, because the IT people are too busy with the day-to-day -day operations to go and evaluate some of these tools for password management, for training, for whatever. So we kind of cross our fingers and, and hope on a wing and a prayer that everything's going to be okay. Yeah. I mean, people aren't checking on it. I'm sure you walk in and, and somebody, they give everybody admin access because they're just lazy and didn't know what to do, uh, things like that. And it's simple things like not leaving devices unattended. You know, you talked about it earlier about, you know, bouncing back and forth from, from personal devices and, and company issued devices. And, you know, I used to be on the road and Starbucks was my second office and I would do a lot of work from there. And it amazed me how often I'd see somebody leave their laptop open and go wait in line and get a cup of coffee or go to the restroom where they're leaving yep. it completely unattended. And you're like, this is a public Wi-Fi. You don't know these people in here. The same goes for the work from anywhere. I mean, I got a seven and a nine year old. They don't think they mean to do bad things, but they want to go Google their Fortnite stuff and Minecraft and all the rest. And who knows what they're clicking on. So, you know, it should just be common sense. But again, if it's not in policies and procedures, it might, might not be common sense to a lot of folks. Right? right. I mean, it's 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 pretty scary stuff. And then you know, that leads into being careful what you click on. Um, I am overly paranoid about everything. But and so is my wife. And she makes fun of me because she says when we ever do click on something, it'll probably be you. And I'm to make fun of you for the rest of your life. Um, but this is something that, again, should be in policies and procedures. If, if you've got a, a, a computer or a laptop or whatever you have that has access to business software, there are places you're just not supposed to go. There needs to be a separation there. And again, it goes into the, the training, but it, it seems like common sense, but it's got to be listed on there. And then at least we start getting into the technology and making sure we talked about complexity and more importantly, the evolution, just like training two years ago might be outdated. I hear folks say, oh, no, 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 we invested in our security three years ago. We're good. We made a huge investment. And unless you're reviewing that, it's a great investment, but you know, I don't know how valuable it's going to be. So, I mean, you know, talk about that a little bit. Bob, about you know just what kind of technologies they're working with and how you evaluate that. Yeah, if 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 you if you essentially cannot talk about an ongoing process, you're not secure. It, it's kind of like to, to your point, if a company invests in the most sophisticated lock for a front door, but then people always block the door open with a cinder block so people can get in easy because it's more efficient and more effective. That, that door is useless. And if no one's monitoring the door to see that that's what's going on, it's doubly useless. So you, you have to have these layers implemented, whether it be training, monitoring, uh, policy and procedures, the technical solutions like antivirus and malware protection. You can't just look for one size fits all. And then each one of those are going to evolve as the threats evolve. Yeah, absolutely. It was interesting too in that ransomware study that we did of the businesses that were 
attacked or actually, you know, the ransomware actually hit them, 94% did have an, an antivirus in place. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have, everybody has to have one, but it just shows that some of those, you know, they just weren't being monitored, they weren't being updated and all the rest. And, and that leads into backups. And that's the world that I live in. But nowadays, I mean, data lives in so many different places, um, whether it's on endpoints that should be sharing at the shared drives, but don't, whether it's uh, things like O365 and the explosion of teams and all the rest, data lives in so many different areas. And having a backup solution in place is a necessity and most people do, but the problem is, is it integrating with everything else? And is there somebody testing those backups? I, I Most businesses get answer how often they're, they're taking their backups, but when I ask them who's testing them and who's actually reporting on that, you get a lot of blank stares. And then you talk about how long is it gonna take you to recover that data? And then there's a lot of uh, you know blank stairs because they don't they don't know they've never done a disaster recovery test and this is you know it's critical not just because it's the world I live in but I mean I think any business should be very uh, you know very diligent in making sure that all of these things are protected. Uh, maybe Bobby, got anything to add on that? Well, backups are the 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 last solution to every problem in IT. You know, period. You know, no matter what the issue is, a good backup is is the is is the final solution if all else fails. And essentially, an untested backup is a form of prayer. Yeah, which is exactly right. I mean, it is your last line of defense, and it's one of those things that people do view as an expense, right? That's one of those things. Oh, it's a necessity, but it really, I mean, it's one of those things that can keep your business up and running. Um, something as simple, again, we talk about policies and procedures. Does your company have a mobile device policy? Another thing that goes overlooked all the time. And again, you can go Google some stories very recently. I mean, there's new ransomware variants out there that are specifically attacking mobile devices. And, you know, it's something that needs to be, you know, needs to be incorporated because there's business data that is being, you know, looked at and addressed from those mobile device, you know, from those mobile devices. And then ultimately, you know, working with that managed service provider to set up, you know, the security testing configurations and those type of things. I mean, this is where, you know, there's there's experts like Bob that come in and, and can do those type of things. And so, you know, it, it becomes a holistic approach in terms of that what that relationship looks like. But, you know, Bob, is there anything on here that I might have missed in terms of what that relationship looks like? No, I mean, you're, you're basically nailing it. The, the, the challenge that you, that you have are, again, it is constantly moving and you also have constant opportunities to try to create protection, to try to, cre try to create good policies and procedures, but you're also expected to keep up with the day-to-day -day operations as well. Yeah, exactly. And the good news is, you know, we, in the, as the business community in general, I mean, we're heading in the right direction. You've taken the time out to, to join this webinar. Hopefully it's been recorded. You could share it with other folks in your office, but um, you know, I think that that's the good thing is that we are starting to see folks open their eyes to all of these things. You know, it, we did that study uh, year after year and 95% of the, the managed services community agreed that things like ransomware were a, a, a huge epidemic right now. We talked to the business owners, that number was under 40% two years ago, which is crazy mm -hmm. to me. And now it's up over 50%, but still way too low, which means that Bob and I aren't doing a good enough job going out there and, uh, and educating these folks. But you know, we're heading in the right direction. I think we're seeing now the reliance on our technology more than ever. And I think, you know, this is one of those things where having a conversation with Bob and his team really can go a long way, even if it's just one of those, you know, evaluation type things. So, I mean, with that, Bob, you got anything to wrap things up? No, basically, if, if any of you are interested, whether you're interested from a management perspective or from an internal IT perspective, uh, just email me the contact Bob at simplex-it.com and I'll send you a copy of my CEO survival guide to information technology as well as uh, I don't want your job as co-managed IT services the right fit for you. Those of you who know me, you know, I don't I don't strong arm sell. We want to build a relationship. That's our priority here. Yeah, and just to give a small plug, I've read all of Bob's books and they're, they're very good, entertaining reads and uh, and unfortunately, I've given mine all away to people because, uh, you know, I, I really think they're great reads. So I encourage you to take a look at that as well. But uh, we said we we're going to keep it to about 30 minutes. So we did that. Um, I appreciate everybody's time here. Uh, again, I highly encourage you might be, you know, there very well might be that you're all set, you know, and everything is good. But it, it's worth another set of eyes, a Bob and his team coming in and taking a look at what you have, see if there's any 
of those gaps, go through that lessons learned to see, you know, that you're prepared for whatever that next, uh, that next piece might be. But uh, Bob, I want to thank you for including me on this. This was a lot of fun. I learned a lot from, from listening to you. So appreciate everybody's time and uh, thank you all very much. Thank you.